For Hastings Street, we knew that it was going to be set very specifically in 49 and 50 in Detroit, in Black Bottom, and Paradise Valley. And so what does that do then to the music that is inherent to that time period? If somebody's walking into a bar in Black Bottom in 1950, what are they going to be hearing? Right. Right? And so there's that aspect to it. Then there's also, I think, some music that isn't necessarily anachronistic to the time period, but that draws a similar contrast that is really speaking to, well, where is a, where is a person, one of the main characters, Renita, has a song called Towers. Like, when what is going through her head? What is she feeling at this moment? And how do we express that through music? I think right now we have this opportunity to, to be on a, at a major stage in what I consider to be a very important city from an artistic and historic standpoint, and to be able to be working with Plowshares Theater and the history that they've really carved out for themselves here in the city of Detroit is really significant. Uh, Gary Anderson's been a longtime collaborator of mine, and I'm really proud to be working with him, really proud of what he's put together in both commissioning us to put this piece together, as well as this production that we're about to see. We were all working on another project that was supposed to be Detroit related that wasn't really Detroit related, and it fell apart, and I think it fell apart for a legitimate reason. It wasn't gonna focus the attention on something that was gonna celebrate Detroit. And so, I decided that th working with them had shown me that they had some talent and what the best thing to do was to seek some funding so that we could get them commissioned to, to create a work that was gonna focus on an un really an untold story in Detroit and that is the conditions that occurred during the raising of the Black Bottom. For me, having family constantly talking about Black Bottom, right. my grandmother used to tell stories about how they would take uh, pennies and coins and like put them on or tack them to the bottom of their shoes and go out and dance in the streets, standing outside listening to music. Yeah. And that neighborhood doesn't exist anymore. Like the city that we grew up in was very different from the city that our grandparents and aunts and uncles and family grew up in. And when there's a difference, I think, between hearing your family talk about a story and then actually doing research and like, investigating that story uh, more thoroughly. And for me, I think it was the idea that this street that could have had however many businesses, mm. stores, shops, homes, families, is now a couple blocks. You know what I'm right. saying? Right. Like, that that to me was, was a great uh, microcosm in understanding what happened to a whole community. And I think even, you know, being in a room like this where we're able to see so much uh, history and so much detail that has been preserved. But then we're talking about an area where it's really the lack of having uh, access to that resource, having access to that even visual reference of what this would have looked like and what this would have been had it still existed now is a large part of what has informed this piece. Because now we're really thinking about what could have this legacy have been mm -hmm. if this had continued? How would have the, it would have shaped the music? How would it have shaped the culture, the, the infrastructure of business? How would it have really have changed the black community in the city of Detroit had those neighborhoods not been destroyed? Hastings Street was a cultural and entertainment hub for black folks. Everything that you think about when you talk about Broadway or you talk about Woodward Avenue here, that was Hastings Street. Right. The stories that happen in Detroit are just as valid as the stories that happen in New York. The people that live in this city, that have lived in this city, in this community, are just as influential, if not, if I dare say so myself, more so sometimes when you start talking about the history of manufacturing sectors and like the birth of the middle class um, and everything that came out of this city and this geography and this people. Um, and that their stories deserve to be told, but their stories deserve to be cherished. I want people to walk away feeling proud of the, the history of our city, and also feeling proud of the musical influence that African Americans have had on the world of music. Because yeah. we have everything represented here. Yeah. Every piece you could ask for, whether we're talking about jazz, whether we're talking about blues, whether we're even talking about the influence that we've had on you know, the music referred to as classical music, or even the influence that it was had on the history of musical theater. If you really think about it, black American music has shaped the face of what yeah. popular music is across the world. We also need to look at that one of the elements that this play talks about is coming together. The importance of people, of a, of a community unifying to work on large challenges. <laughs> I get choked up about that. Because it means a lot. We, Plowshares, has instituted this policy of what we call Harambe. It's a Kenyan principle. In Swahili, Harambe means all pulled together. 
which shows you the importance of nobody does anything. <sighs> nobody does anything alone. And um, others have to be invested and see the benefit of being engaged. And one of the messages of this story is that even though this community was, dis was fractured and displaced, the, the key to us moving things forward in Detroit is by coming together, having a common interest and a common goal. Um, and I think that's the main thing that I could get across. The idea of this story being used to convey that message to, this, to the people who see it, hopefully, hopefully, might spark some people to see that as a solution for our current situation.